Good afternoon, everyone. And I want to welcome you to all to the first ever virtual Sadat Forum. Thank you to our speaker, Dr. Fiona Hill, and to my colleague, Dr. Telhami, for bringing us together today. I'm Daryl Pines, and I'm proud to be the 34th president of the University of Maryland. I started on July 1st of this year, and it has been an honor to serve in this role. These past months have presented a set of challenges that we didn't expect, but we are facing together. We are in the middle of a pandemic and are dealing with longstanding issues of racial injustice. These two pandemics have impacted us all in different ways, yet it has connected us in many other ways. In our current climate, it is important to host virtual events like the Sadat Forum to keep the university community engaged with these challenging issues. We cannot hit pause on tackling the pressing issues of our time. We must gather virtually to exchange ideas until it's safe once again to gather in large groups. I'm extremely proud of the work we're doing to stay connected. Let's continue to be Terrapin strong. Today, I also have the pleasure of introducing my good friend and colleague, Dean Gregory Ball. Professor Ball has served as the Dean of the College of Behavior and Social Sciences since 2014. Dean Ball joined the college with a commitment to excellence in teaching while working in the environment of a leading research institution. We are aligned in this as my stated priorities as president are to promote excellence in everything that we do. This includes teaching and learning, research, innovation and entrepreneurship, creative expression, the arts and athletics, and to create an inclusive multicultural campus community. Excellence must be rooted in our values because what the university does matters. Dean Ball continues to support the Sadat Chair, the Critical Issues Poll, and the formation of the Center for Democracy and Civic Engagement. Dean Ball is an active researcher himself in the field of behavioral neuroscience, and I'm proud to call him a colleague. I wanna thank all of you for allowing me to be part of this treasured Sadat Forum on our campus. And now please welcome Dean Gregory Ball. Thank you, President Pines. Uh, thank you for your leadership. I am very pleased to welcome you all to the 2020 Sadat Forum. The Sadat Forum is one of the most significant events sponsored by the Anwar Sadat Chair for Peace and Development. This chair was established in 1977 and has been held since its inception by Professor Shibli Telhami. Professor Telhami is a distinguished political scientist, having received his PhD from the University of California at Berkeley and held several faculty positions, most recently Cornell, just prior to his arrival to come to the University of Maryland to assume the Sadat chair. Professor Talhami's academic home is in the Department of Government and Politics here at UMD, and he is an expert on US foreign policy and diplomacy, especially as it relates to the Middle East conflict. The Sadat chair is one of three peace chairs we have in the College of Behavioral and Social Sciences that provide us with a vehicle to discuss significant national and international issues in a broader cultural and ethical context. The Sadat Forum is a signature event for the College of Behavioral and Social Sciences and indeed for all of the campus. In recent years, the Sadat Forum has welcomed Thomas Friedman, Senator Chris Von Hollen, Ambassador David Satterfield, and in one event, Dr. Talhami organized a distinguished panel to review the 40th anniversary of the Camp David Accords. Today, we are pleased to welcome Dr. Fiona Hill, who has a distinguished career in academe and government. Most recently, as most of you know, she was deputy assistant to the president and senior director for European and Russian affairs on the National Security Council staff. She is currently a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution here in Washington. I now turn the flo floor over to Professor Talhami to formally introduce Dr. Hill and the forum. Thank you, Professor Tahami. Well, thank you, uh, President Pines and Dean Ball uh, for the introduction. Uh, and Fiona, uh, I really wanna personally welcome you to campus. Uh, uh, you know, um, so we have known each other for 20 years, we've been friends and colleagues, we've co-authors, uh, and yet we have never hosted you at the University of Maryland, except for now, the first, the first time it's virtual. But I do assure you, had it not been virtual, uh, at this moment, after the Dean had introduced you, you would have had a standing ovation. And I'm sorry you didn't get to experience that in, in because you have so much enthusiasm 
uh, among our community and, and for obvious reasons. Uh, but I think everyone feels you have handled yourself with honor and dignity, particularly with regard to the impeachment and since um, uh, you've been the ultimate professional. It's not a surprise to those of us who knew you all these years, uh, but obviously I think everyone has discovered that. And, and it's in all honesty, uh, Fiona, um, um, in all these 20 years when we have worked together, uh, I, I, have, I don't know whether you're a Republican or a Democrat. I, I, it has never been an issue to think about it because nothing that you have said or done or worked on reflected uh, this at all. Uh, so I am honored to be a friend and your colleague, uh, and I really appreciate you taking the time to join us. I know how busy this period is for you. Uh, so thank you and welcome. Well, thank you very much, Sibley. It's great to be here, even if it is virtually, and you know, hopefully at some point we'll all be able to get back to our physical lives again. And um, obviously, um, as being a citizen of Maryland, I'd love to uh, get back onto the flagship uh, campus at some point. So thank you at least, you know, for, for having me here in, uh, in this context. It's a real honor. Well, go, go, great to have you. So let me start really with the, with the core issue um, uh, uh, before us. Um, uh, you, you left the, White House, the, the Trump White House in, last July, uh, July, uh, July 2019, I mean. Uh, and um, you had been obviously the top official in the White House working on Russia. Uh, you had been all your career uh, at, uh, studying Russia and an expert on Russia, writing about Russia. Uh, you have been, uh, you know, in the National Intelligence Council as a top expert on Russia, both in Republican and Democratic uh, uh, administrations. So it's not a surprise that when you testified uh, on the Hill at a very critical time in our nation, uh, in the hearing, the impeachment hearing, President uh, Trump, uh, people listened because uh, you had the weight of that experience and history behind you. And you said uh, during that impeachment trial, you said, I refuse to be part of an effort to legitimize an alternate narrative that the Ukrainian government is a US adversary and that Ukraine, not Russia, attacked us in 2016. These fictions are harmful, even if they are deployed for purely domestic political purposes, unquote. Could you elaborate on that, uh, both in terms of mm -hmm. the context in, uh, you know, of those words, how, how you, um, you know, what propelled you into this? Obviously what propelled you is you were subpoenaed to testify, you had no choice, uh, but obviously, mm -hmm. um, you know, the way you presented this uh, must have uh, had a background about how you saw the picture in terms of where the Senate laws were where the American public was. So I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit more on that, on that remark. Well, thanks, uh, Shibli. I mean, obviously, you know, this is a, um, a painful issue for all of us uh, to be discussing. Um, it's not often um, that um, any of us um, are witnessing the impeachment of a president, even though, of course, you know, we, we did have um, uh, the same thing happening, um, uh, you know, in a um, not so uh, distant past. But I also wrote um, an op-ed um, earlier on um, this month uh, in the New York Times in which you know, I also uh, called out my great concern about the domestic situation. And obviously, you know, for a foreign policy uh, um, expert and analyst like myself, you know, we don't often stray into domestic politics. But I came to see both in the run up uh, to uh, the depositions and the testimony this time last year, and in the period that I was um, in the administration, how much our own domestic political situation uh, was contributing to um, a national security crisis. We've become so polarized and so pulled apart by partisan sentiment. Well before um, the election of 2016 and the Russian decision to intervene in those elections, that now, you know, even issues like dealing with Russia or China, um, Iran, uh, you know, the area that, that you're um, most working on around Middle East um, in general have become uh, the subject of partisan debate. And foreign policy has often uh, now become part of our domestic political discourse. That didn't used to be the case. 
um, you know, it was actually comparatively easy to be a non-partisan foreign policy expert um, not so long ago, because there was much more of a shared non-political perspective on what US national security should look like. That's not to say that we didn't need to have you know, some hard questions asked about whether you know, our assumptions uh, that our foreign policy was built on needed to be revisited you know, as times have changed, whether you know, kind of the foreign policy that we were following you know, should be um, refurbished and rethought for you know, what's now a new century and a new um, era 30 years after the end of the Cold War with so many larger you know, challenges that we hadn't thought about uh, before coming onto the docket. But the idea that dealing with a foreign country should be part of our domestic policy uh, was anathema. And so that was really, you know, what prompted me to say some of the things I never thought that I would uh, be saying. And it was also the experience that I and the other witnesses had um, in the period leading up to the public testimony. We'd all been, as you mentioned, subpoenaed. Uh, we were fact witnesses. We were not there for one side or the other. We were all non-partisan uh, professionals. I mean, some of admittedly were um, political appointees um, in uh, their positions, but also on the basis of expertise in foreign policy or um, in the case of my um, successor at the um, National Security Council, Tim Morrison, on the basis of deep expertise in arms control. We were not, you know, kind of political operatives in any way whatsoever. We, we were attacked on all sides uh, for, um, you know, basically upholding the oath of office and also, um, you know, believing in congressional oversight and in the, um, you know, the uh, constitutional um, structures that, uh, that brought us to, uh, to this point. And it was really the, um, for me, the experience of the closed door deposition, which then was made public, all 445 pages of it, uh, that, that got me so alarmed uh, because of what I evidently saw as efforts to twist around facts um, into these fictions that I felt I needed to call this out because US national security was on the line, not just uh, the machinations of domestic politics. And I think we're still in that um, situation today. I mean, another issue that prompted me to write the op-ed um, at the beginning of the month was um, uh, observing you know, the ways in which this narrative uh, about Ukraine and what happened in Ukraine has been playing out throughout this presidential campaign. Uh, and also, you know, the, the fact that we continue to see, you know, interference uh, from, uh, from Russia and other adversaries in propagating out um, narratives. But the main point is that domestic actors are taking these forward. And that this has become again part of uh, the political debate and the politicization of every issue including COVID-19 and public health issues that we're all so well aware of um, it, it's become so extreme that we can't get our act together on critical issues and it's had an enormous impact on our um, international standing the recent Pew poll that um, was conducted during the summer but was only just released um, a few weeks ago, showing that um, uh, you know across 13 of our closest partners and allies, uh, the countries, our ratings have fallen to lows that we haven't seen since, in fact, the US decision to invade Iraq in 20, um, uh, 2003. So, I mean, we've really fallen a long way in the estimation of um, some of our closest uh, allied countries as a result of this polarization and the fracturing of our, of our politics and the fact that our whole foreign policy now has become mired in domestic controversy. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, I'm gonna come back to this, our standing in the world and how we can work it because um, you are a Russia expert, but you're also a European expert and you also headed the Center on Europe uh, at Brookings before joining the, the Trump administration. Uh, so I wanna come back to that, but I wanna stick with the Russian intervention um, then and now. Uh, and I wanna note something really interesting because you know when you, um, uh, you know, uh, spoke um, out uh, at the hearing, particularly, and obviously uh, later on, we we have a you know joint uh, report from the Senate, bipartisan report from the Senate, finding uh, absolute you know uh, the, leaves no doubt about uh, Russian intervention in the 2016 election, and yet what's interesting is that public opinion um, has been polarized even on this issue. And so, for example, in our um, critical issues poll, uh, which was conducted several months after you testified, it was in March of last year, um, we, we asked uh, even a softer question, not about intervention in the election, but degree of influence. So we had, a, how much influence do you think 
Russia has on American politics and policies. We asked it that softly because we want to compare it with other countries to get a sense of you know how much people what people think. And what's interesting here is that two thirds of Americans uh, think Russia has too much influence. That's not a surprise. But what's interesting is the among Republicans, Republicans are divided almost down the middle. Forty-two uh, percent say Russia has about the right level of influence. Forty-two percent of Republicans. And 45 say too much influence, they're divided. So what's interesting is that even on a question like this, where has been, there has been you know, findings um, that are um, uh, coming out of American institutions like intelligence, but also out of bipartisan panels on, on, uh, uh, in, in Congress, you have this public opinion divide. Um, uh, and, and that obviously is, you know, is telling in and of itself how it can play into the politics. Does that worry you? Well, look, the overall issue, I think, is quite hard for people to follow, for one thing. Um, I mean, I think even in that question of influence, you know, what do you really mean by that? Because, you know, what we saw happen in 2016 um, was a kind of a mixture of sort of old style Russian kind of propaganda efforts, the kind of thing that we saw in the Cold War, even the inventing of false personas and spreading disinformation and false information. You know, the Soviet Union used to do that throughout the Cold War, we used to do some of that as well. Um, but then, you know, the other issue of influence of trying to shape public opinion, you know, with new social media platforms, um, you know, that have taken off over, you know, the last decades, anyone can do that. I mean, you, we, can, we can see ourselves um, the impact that, you know, people can have uh, through Twitter. I mean, the president's uh, Twitter um, feed is one of the you know, most widely followed, but there are all kinds of other individuals as well who rival him in terms of, um, uh, you know, their, their, their following and they can tweet about whatever they want. You know, they could be celebrity figures or, you know, people have nothing to do, frankly, with politics. But if they start tweeting about political um, issues, people will follow that. We all know about the phenomenon of Twitter bots, of, you know, kind of basically, you know, um, computers that people can kind of rent to, you know, uh, push up um, their ability to uh, disseminate information. And, you know, I think that that makes it very difficult for everybody, you know, who's participated in social media as just the average consumer to kind of really figure out what's going on. All kinds of people can influence public opinion. We're in a whole new world of this. And, you know, part of the problem that happened in 2016 uh, was Facebook, Twitter uh, and other um, uh, social media platforms not really realizing how much their platforms could be used as tools of influence by any state or non-state actor. And it's taken a while to catch this catch up. So when you were doing this poll in the early stages of 2016, it wasn't perhaps even clear to people quite what was going on. And in terms then, you know, of kind of how Russia fed into this, you know, I'm sure there's an awful lot of people who went and polled in different kind of ways would say, well, as far as they know, Russia had no impact on their opinions about things. That people are much more influenced by their own networks, you know, the people in their own uh, little bubbles of on Facebook or elsewhere where they're all, you know, swapping stories. You know, you're more likely to look at something that you get from a friend or a close associate or a celebrity that you're following. Now, of course, if, you know, a, a Russian or some other person is masquerading as um, this individual and pushing out material or they've, they've uh, created another persona uh, on Facebook, which we know that they actually did, then, you know, kind of that um, becomes part of the picture, but it's very hard for people to unravel. So I think that, you know, what we were seeing back last year was people find it very hard to follow all the threads of all of this. And when we see um, uh, a case where domestic actors are as much the purveyors of disinformation, the false narratives, are also huge um, users as well as consumers of um, social media, it makes us it, it incredibly difficult to tackle this. And this is what makes me worried. I think it's much easier for us to roll back uh, adversaries when they're trying to tamper with the physical infrastructure. It's not easy. And we were all worried about ransomware attacks and you know, more efforts to penetrate into our critical um, infrastructure. But the hardest thing of all is to tackle this, you know, what we might call hacking the minds or efforts to 
uh, manipulate um, public opinion because so many other people are in the mix on this as well. And it's partly then the regulation of um, social media platforms by them themselves, their efforts to kind of root out um, uh, falsehoods, lies. I mean, we can see, you know, some of this kind of happening right now, but it's also on incumbent on us, the consumer, to be much more circumspect about the information that we're getting from our friends and relatives and, you know, other people who are sending us things. Um, yeah, I, I mean, one of the questions, of course, um, you know, it, it is really relates to the impact of those interventions. They're easy to do, they're hard to fight off. Uh, do they have an impact? So, um, uh, last year, um, at the University of Maryland, I moderated a, um, a conversation uh, with, Gen with General James Clapper, someone you know well uh, and work with, and uh, who uh, said that um, in his own estimation, um, the, in, in the Russian intervention in 2016 did have an impact on the results of our election. Uh, more recently, uh, last month actually, um, I hosted a scholar um, who, his name is Doug Lovin, who has a new book um, out uh, called Meddling in the Ballot Box, uh, and an interesting book that just came out last month uh, that reviews kind of international interventions, the, the interventions by big powers in around the world, including American interventions, as you know, the US yep. has been known to intervene in, in, in elections uh, worldwide, maybe more than anyone else, uh, uh, in the past. Um, and, and then he also studied the case of the 26th Russian intervention. What's novel about the book is not only that it puts it in historical perspective, but it devises a way of measuring, does it really matter for the outcome of the election? And, and after he does that for multiple cases historically, he applies the same methodology and model to the Russian intervention case. Now, I wanna read you uh, what he concluded. He concluded that the effects of this intervention have been large enough to have led Clinton to lose 75 electoral college votes, the states of Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Florida, enough to have caused the loss in the electoral college. So his assessment based on his data and model, obviously everything is debatable, uh, is that it, it really had an impact. And that certainly was uh, the case with General Clapper, who was, doing, who was looking at it strictly through the prism of intelligence and assessment of the degree to which it had an impact. Is that something you can reflect on? Do you agree with that assessment that it actually impacted our election? Well, I think it had a, a, an, an impact in the aggregate. I'd like to actually see, because I haven't read this book, about how he ties those you know, 78,000 um, votes in three counties in three states directly to Russian intervention. Because I'll just speak from an anecdotal um, perspective. So my, part of my in-laws live in Kenosha County in Wisconsin. And I know from talking to them immediately after the election that there was nothing um, uh, that came from any kind of Russian uh, effort that swayed their decision not to vote for either candidate in the election. And I talked to rather a lot of people in, you know, kind of in and around town in that, uh, in that particular uh, juncture. And what was interesting there was the margin uh, by which President Trump won was extraordinarily small. And if you look to the people who sat out and didn't, didn't actually uh, vote for any presidential candidate, it was far larger. And they were swayed by all kinds of other perception issues. Now, some of those could have been related to some of the attacks against uh, Secretary Hill, um, Clinton that were going on that you know, the Russians were amplifying, but there were plenty of other domestic actors that were doing that. But they didn't vote for President Trump either. And in many cases, you know, some people voted for a third party candidate to write in or they just didn't, they just left it blank. And they were much more likely to vote based on their own perceptions of what was going on in their own uh, communities, which were feeling that conventional politicians or politicians overall were ignoring them. But I think in the aggregate, when we start to think about this was a kind of a perfect storm, a confluence of very unfortunate events in 2016. Because we had a very contentious election. We had a wild card candidate in the person of President Trump, who the Republican Party didn't expect to become uh, their uh, candidate. Uh, Hillary Clinton was in a bruising battle um, with um, Senator Bernie Sanders, who was standing for re-election uh, or, or, or reaffirmation as a candidate this time around as well. And hit, a lot of his supporters decided not 
to um, support um, Secretary Clinton, and I met a few of them in um, Kenosha County as well, and there was no way that they were going to uh, vote for her, and that was based on their other perceptions. But what the Russian um, intervention did was cast an enormous amount of doubt on the outcome. And so this is, of course, it had an impact. It reduced everybody's confidence in the outcome, and it obviously led to a lot of people uh, deciding that President Trump had been elected by Vladimir Putin and the security services and was illegitimate. And so what the Russian um, intervention did was it had an enormous impact on the entirety of this last four years. It reduced our confidence in the election. They themselves, of course, wanted to take credit for it. They were, as I said in my op-ed, quite delighted uh, that we gave them the credit for it. We, in fact, ceded victory uh, to the Russian intelligence services by these kinds of statements and assertions. And, you know, again, I'd like to see some, you know, direct correlation between those 78,000 votes and, you know, kind of the efforts of the security services. I'm sure that that's what they said in their report back, you know, to the boss in the Kremlin for their bonuses and their medals for, you know, whatever they did in uh, 2016. But the biggest impact we're living out now, which is the fact that we no longer believe that we have our own agency in our um, democracy and that somebody else is pulling the levers. And we even have, you know, we have our own president saying the system's rigged, as, uh, asking questions about the ballot. And that whole Russian intervention in a way unleashed all of that. It gave everybody the sense that our democracy had failed and that um, our whole electoral um, system had broken down. Even though of course, you know, we've got so many articles still going on now about the difficulties of the electoral college and the anachronism you know, of, a, of a system that was developed back in the 18th century for a very different uh, time. And you know, how you know, um, voters in um, California, uh, you know, their individual votes far outweighed by you know, voters in Wyoming you know, because of the whole you know, discrepancy in population now. I mean, we've got a lot of structural factors as well that we need to factor in here. So it's not that you know, I, I'm um, opposed to a, a conclusion if somebody lays it out, but I think that the, the, but the effect was bigger in the aggregate. And you know, what it's done is it, it's really, it's messed with our minds, not just hacked our minds. We've lost the confidence in our own democracy. And the point that I was making in the op-ed um, at the beginning of October is we do have agency. I mean, the reason it also had such an impact was that turnout was so low. And you know, we're having a debate about whether voting should be mandatory. And I'm sure a lot of your surveys people are not keen on that either. But the, the fact is if we have a large turnout uh, it's much harder to mess around with those margins. Yeah, and I, you know it's kind of interesting because I, I know that you know your piece in the New York Times is excellent uh, and and lays a lot of this stuff out. Um, I think we all had fears that there will be de demoralization about our system, uh, and and obviously that that is there now. We're all we're all terrified by that prospect that people don't have confidence uh, in, that their votes will count even, and and so that might actually. Uh, you know, uh, mean that the turnout may be smaller than expected, but that hasn't been the case, right? So what we see so far, at least in the early voting, is amazing energy, uh, especially among Democrats uh, who are voting in large numbers in the polling that we have done uh, through the critical issues poll, we find that people are extremely motivated to vote. So while they have doubts uh, about whether they're fearful that their votes may not count. It's not stopping people, people from voting. That's the evidence. So the question I have is whether on the other side, in the practical terms, I know that when you were in government, uh, obviously intelligence agencies, the US government, uh, uh, high tech companies were already kind of taking some steps to limit foreign intervention, not just Russian. That was one of the blatant cases in 2016. But as you said, it's easy that a lot of other players uh, who have an interest in the impact in our election. Uh, a lot of people have learned from what transpired in 2016. Um, do you have confidence that there have been more measures uh, from American brokers, especially intelligence communities and high tech to limit the impact or are we in the same place? Uh, what, how would you assess that in terms of the readiness of our institutions and agencies uh, and businesses to cope with that potential in 2020 compared to 2016? No, we're not in the same place because I think we have obviously as a result of that shock to the system, you know, we have done an awful lot to try to address it. I mean, we had a failure of imagination in 2016 to think that the Russians, you know, could do the kind of thing to us that they've been doing in Moldova or Ukraine or 
Georgia or you know a whole uh, a former Soviet um, Republic or elsewhere in Eastern Europe, for example. We failed to see that we were also vulnerable and you know kind of weakened by uh, partisan infighting, and that you know kind of uh, just like. Putin and others, you know, at, uh, in the security services could whip up sentiments at home and manipulate public opinion to quash domestic opposition or to, you know, ensure certain outcomes. They could use the same tactics here in the United States. We'd become complacent and, you know, we'd left some of these Cold War machinations behind that you were referring to, some of the things that we used to do back in the day. We'd kind of moved on and we sort of assumed everybody else had too and they hadn't. And, you know, why Russia did this was, of course, to try to neutralize us as a threat, because we still have the capacity and capabilities to do a great deal to them. And of course, the Russians would fear that if we decided to use new cyber tools against them in some you know, future conflict, we would really, um, you know, devastate them. And also their perception was that we were meddling around in their politics, you know, various statements about the transparency um, of their elections or the lack of it, the fact that their elections were not free and fair. You know, I think that they were sticking it right back at us to show us that, um, you know, we were full of hubris and that, you know, we had plenty of our own problems. It's, you know, kind of a sort of a, a, a revenge operation as much as um, uh, also one um, to push back on a security threat. And so, you know, once we realize that, yes, they could do that, we have tackled a lot of the problems, the open doors that they could walk through in 2016, particularly on the technical side. Now, there's lots of other areas where, you know, kind of there are still some weaknesses and vulnerabilities. We see that with ransomware. And, you know, this doesn't have to be Russians, but there's plenty of criminal groups. Some of them could be run by the Russian security services who could, um, you know, carry these out. There's still the, the risk of hack and release in emails, um, fabrication of emails. We you know we saw that the Russians did that in France, you know, for example, it's been in the press. The Norwegians have recently complained and the Germans did previously about Russian um, efforts to hack into, you know, their politicians' emails. So they're still doing this. Uh, but again, the, the biggest area is in the vulnerability in our public opinion. And we've done a lot with uh, Facebook has done a lot. I mean, a lot of the revelations about what the Russians have done have come from the private sector. They've come from the um, social media platforms themselves. And I think, you know, the population as a whole, the rest of us has become more savvy as well. We've become a bit more suspect um, um, of you know, random phishing attempts and things that we get sent. But we're still awash in disinformation. We ourselves in the United States are some of the biggest creators of conspiracy theories. And we're exporting QAnon around the world right now, including, you know, in the United Kingdom and, and, and other um, places. This is a homegrown conspiracy. And so, I mean, we are part of the problem uh, now, too. And that's something that we're going to have to address moving forward, because that propensity for creating disinformation for our own political purposes I mean, all of our political parties have super PACs, the political action committees, and I think that the Russians just act like a super PAC. This is the Vladimir Putin super PAC. And as you said, the Chinese and others can do that too, but it's primarily up until now really been the Russians, even though others have dabbled around in this. While we still have that, and we have a lot of money sloshing around in politics, and we also have a lot of dirty money you know, circulating around in the United States, I and mean, we were a massive center also for money laundering, that's why we re uh, remain vulnerable. And we'll remain vulnerable to manipulation by all kinds of actors unless we get our act together domestically. Yeah, that you know, that it's, I'm really glad that you brought up the domestic conspiracy theories because that's another fear we all face, uh, regardless of Russia and, and other intervention. Um, I want to uh, shift a little bit to another area of expertise, specifically to President Putin himself. Um, uh, you have studied him. Uh, you have uh, co-authored a book with Cliff Gaddy, uh, Mr. Putin, Operative in the Kremlin, which is an excellent book. I learned so much uh, from you about Putin himself. Uh, and, um, and it's obviously, uh, even though it was published several years ago, it's still very timely. And a lot of people are trying to understand uh, first what Putin is up to, but also his relationship with President Trump. So let me start first with one of your key conclusions in the book and ask you to elaborate a little bit more that that um, those who think that Putin is uh, merely an opportunist uh, are uh, really wrong and uh, 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 that he's a strategic thinker uh, with deep help, deep help, deeply held views that are really hard to influence from the outside. 
And unless you understand that, you're not going to be able to deal with him uh, properly. Uh, could you elaborate on that? Yeah, look, it, it depends on how we think about strategy, because obviously what we see Putin do is take every opportunity that he can, exploit any vulnerability in every opening to push ahead with an agenda. So if you think of strategy less as a kind of a blueprint and more as a kind of a broader uh, frame in which he's operating to push forward um, Russian interests, to give Russia the maximum uh, maneuverability, uh, to make sure that you know Russia is counted among the great powers on a global um, basis, not just regionally, uh, that Russia's interests are always going to be taken into consideration in all of the four that matter, then you know one can really understand what Putin is about. We also have to um, bear in mind that he's pretty ruthless. And you know, we've, we've seen that time and time again. I mean, we spent you know, a lot of time um, in the administration as previous administrations have, um, have, have done somewhat fruitlessly trying to you know, dissuade you know, Russian counterparts from engaging in the kind of dirty tricks that we saw in uh, 2016. Part of it's because they said, well, you used to do that too. You know, but we have not hacked and released you know, the emails of um, you know, um, all kinds of Russian politicians and don't think it's because we couldn't. Now, Putin probably actually doesn't, you know, sit around, you know, get texting and, you know, kind of uh, on the email, but, you know, others presumably do. But we just, we've, we, we just are not doing that. That's a kind of a tactical um, area that we haven't, uh, we haven't gone into. We're not running around poisoning people and, you know, kind of, and carrying out these, you know, kind of um, uh, efforts, you know, to kind of, I mean, we've, we've certainly engaged in assassination. So, you know, I don't want to go too far with uh, this kind of point, but the kinds of things that we've, you know, seen, you know, recently in um, the, you know, the brazen uh, assassination attempt against Sergei Skripal in Salisbury that, you know, put in danger the entire population of that small town, or, you know, the recent poisoning of Alexei Navalny, uh, you know, the gunning down of um, a Chechen dissident in the Tiergarten in Berlin. I mean, I could go on and on and on. Litvinenko and the Polonium um, uh, assault in, in London. Those are not the kinds of things that we've engaged in. And there's a kind of a no holds barred approach uh, to uh, the, the messaging uh, that Putin and the people around him are, um, are uh, indulging in. But again, this is part of a larger frame because it's meant to scare the heck out of anybody who would want to cross them. These are highly targeted. Uh, the messaging is very clear. There's no ambiguity about it, even if, you know, kind of the denial um, is always, you know, rather elaborately engaged in all kinds of implausible deniability as, um, you know, various uh, people uh, often like to quip. But the, the messaging is very strong and very clear. And it's all in service of a broader, you know, Russian national interest so that people will at least fear and respect Russia even uh, in, in through that, uh, uh, you know, acknowledging the brazenness of its activity, even if they don't always accept Russia as um, this kind of major player on the world stage. Um, well, you, you also say in the book, uh, interestingly, um, that, um, th that Putin has his limits, that obviously she shouldn't be uh, overestimated. But one of the things that is surprising is uh, that how little you believe he's, he understands Western leaders and their behavior and, and how few contacts he has that are trustworthy to you know, inform him about that. And, and, and that kind of an interesting point to keep in mind, but has that changed with Donald Trump? Because uh, it seems as if most people uh, read him like a book. And so I'm, I'm just wondering whether that assessment that you made in the pre-Trump era, whether that remains to be true and how else do you explain the relationship between Putin and Trump? Well, that's actually the one part of the book generally that I would probably um, reassess at this particular point. Because again, that gets into the sort of the failure of imagination you know, point that you know, I would put myself into um, as well on this. Because, you know, when I was writing uh, the book along with Cliff and we, we um, put out a second edition to explain what had happened in Ukraine with the annexation of Crimea and, you know, the triggering off of war in Donbass in um, 2015, you know, we were writing really about these kind of efforts that, you know, uh, Russia and Putin and others were making that were targeted against, you know, the former Eastern Bloc and, you know, kind of more vulnerable European countries. We did say a lot in uh, that 
final part of the book could, could be applied to the United States, but we haven't really applied it to the United States. And, you know, kind of, I think, you know, what we should have really understood was how, you know, what Putin doesn't believe that anyone has any kind of altruism or that people are indeed uh, enter public service, you know, for example, for something other than their own personal private gain. And so, you know, kind of basically a, a leader like Angela Merkel, he doesn't really understand very well you know, a chancellor who isn't all that interested, I mean, she's coming to the end of her tenure now, in her own personal enrichment and, you know, personal power. She's obviously interested in power and influence, but she doesn't operate in the way that, you know, he thinks. You know, uh, uh, the um, uh, Prime Minister of uh, New Zealand would just be, you know, kind of blow his mind. I mean, in, in the, the idea of the way, you know, that she conducts herself and, you know, it's kind of, um, she's just been uh, re-elected again in a landslide. People like that don't really kind of fit into the worldview, but he does understand um, how to push buttons. And when people are corrupt, uh, where, where their, you know, personal interests are uh, completely discernible, that's when Putin knows how to operate. I mean, basically, when he joined the KGB in the 1970s, he joined at a time uh, when the KGB in his hometown then of Leningrad, you know, Lettis and Petersburg, were figuring out how to um, get tabs on all kinds of Western businessmen. I mean, at that point, they were mostly coming over from West Germany or, you know, elsewhere in Europe, figuring out what made them tick, luring in them to all kinds of honey traps and, you know, kind of inappropriate interactions or behavior that could use it later on used to blackmail. They were collecting information on pretty much everybody and anybody you know, who came in at the time looking for things that could be manipulated later. Now, it doesn't have to be, you know, any particularly, you know, concrete information. It's just how do these people act? Where can you manipulate them? And how do you do it at the lowest cost possible? If it's, you know, kind of a manipulation of certain flaws in their personality, you'll take that. You don't have to engage in, you know, massive elaborate uh, blackmail. So wherever, you know, a, a leader um, has a vulnerability, that's where Putin will hone in. And to use um, Angela Merkel again, it's an episode I related in the book. It's now, you know, since we related it there and it was told to me, it's been told to many other times, was he knew that Merkel, who he couldn't really figure out how to get to any other ways, was uh, really afraid of dogs uh, because of an incident um, in which he'd been bitten. And, you know, they made her very nervous. So what does he do on, you know, what's first meetings with her? He allows his dog um, to basically come uh, during, you know, meeting in his um, uh, his residence and to come and sniff around her feet in the middle of an official meeting. I mean, who does that? Well, who does that is Vladimir Putin, because, you know, the whole effort was to intimidate her and put her off a game. Now, you know, the chance of being the chancellor, you know, managed to weather that storm. It really annoyed everybody around her. But it was just so obvious that he was looking for whatever, you know, vulnerability that he would have. So. Absolutely. Whatever vulnerability of any leader, I mean, you know, clearly they will exploit it. Um, well, that sounds, you know, from, from Putin's uh, perspective, it sounds like this is a tactic he employs universally. But um, many of your colleagues in the White House, uh, senior colleagues in the White House who come out, who, who express worries about how vulnerable our president, particularly given his propensities and personality and predispositions, vulnerable to influences. I'm also co-authoring a book on the Trump and Obama presidencies, and we interviewed uh, uh, privately some of your colleagues in the, White, in the Trump White House who expressed some of the same uh, fears about how vulnerable this particular president is uh, to such influences. Uh, we, did you sense that when you were in the White House? Was that something that was pervasive fear about um, the president's um, uh, you know, personality and his uh, habits that made him uh, much more susceptible uh, to the kind of strategic manipulative leaders uh, like, like Putin. I did worry about that. Look, a lot of other um, past presidents have um, sought to try to create a personal relationship, find personal chemistry uh, with Putin, and as a result have made themselves vulnerable. This president, I think, was uniquely vulnerable for a whole variety of reasons, but others are as well when they try to hide things. I mean, my piece of advice, just in a general term after this, you know, depending on where we headed, is that every president, every presidential candidate in future who gets to be the candidate of a main party should have a security clearance done. 
they should make all of their financial data available. I certainly had to, just like anybody else who is seeking office, so that we can make sure that they're not man, uh, vulnerable to manipulation and blackmail. Because it doesn't just have to be by Vladimir Putin. It can be by anybody. I mean, anybody can come forward with information. We ought to be able to know about that. I mean, part of the reason, you know, that we had an impeachment uh, this time and, you know, in, in the past um, with Bill Clinton uh, and that whole effort was because people were hiding things. They were um, engaging in behavior that wasn't appropriate. Or they, you know, they're letting in, you know, people who are not part of the government who are trying to influence um, uh, events for their own purposes. This is something that makes you uniquely vulnerable. Our whole system is uniquely vulnerable. We lay ourselves open by all of the dirty money that um, is being laundered within our, um, uh, you know, our states. I mean, we have some of the largest centers of money laundering in the world. It's not just the Cayman Islands, the Seychelles and all the other places that people enumerate. It's, it's places here in the United States. You know, it, it's, it, this is kinds of things that we have to tackle. I know that um, uh, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse and a larger bipartisan group are, are trying to tackle this right now. And I think from the lessons that we've learned over the last um, several presidencies from what we know about the way our adversaries behave is that we need to, again, clean up our act, close down all of those loopholes. And I would absolutely advocate, I don't know, you know how this would be done, that future presidential candidates when it gets to um, you know, the time that they're being sub uh, submitted to the larger population have had all the appropriate background checks done. Yeah, um, you know, if, if, you, if you look at where we are um, right now on Russia and Putin, um, we are a divided country in, in ways that none of us have seen ever. Um, uh, and not even just along party lines, more you know, Trump and, and his opponents in some ways. And so if you're Trump's friend, you know, Democrats are going to dislike you. And that has transmitted itself into positions that people have uh, along uh, partisan lines. So therefore, Russia particularly is demonized because it is seen as kind of a friend or manipulating a Trump. Uh, and, and that's true about many issues where the positions are really broken down along partisan line much more than objective analysis of the issue itself. Are you worried that Democrats are demonizing Russia too much to build the constructive relationship that we must have with them? Well, look, there's no point in demonizing anybody or anything, because just as you're saying, it then prevents you from having objective analysis. And, you know, I recently um, took part in an open letter from 100 plus, um, you know, former officials and other analysts that were just trying to actually get that point across. There's no you know, suggestion that we need to reset our relationship with Russia, appease Russia in any particular way, but we have to get back to looking at Russia as a national security challenge. And we have to also be able to engage with Russia um, through regular diplomacy, just like we do with China. And you know, we've even been attempting with North Korea and, and other countries. The reason that we have not been able to is precisely because of this um, idea that Russia has been at the heart of our democracy pulling our levers and has, and has basically chosen sides in um, our, uh, uh, our domestic politics. Russia didn't take sides in our domestic politics. Russia came in to you know, basically undermine our democracy. The sides were you know, not because of a particular political preference, but just to kind of basically you know, play everyone off against each other. In 2016, we should have um, uh, been cognizant of the fact that we were attacked broadly. You know, if there'd been, you know, another candidate other than Hillary Clinton running in the, the, for the Democrats who had been espousing a strong line against uh, Russia, they would have been attacked as well. It was a quirk of fate that uh, Donald Trump became the candidate for the Republicans. There were 17 candidates that has knocked themselves out in the course of the primary. And I know for a fact that the Russians were probing, you know, those other candidates' campaigns as well. They were poised to try to interfere in, in any way that they possibly could to undermine our overall faith in our democracy for their own purposes because they believed that we were doing that to them. They wanted to weaken us, take us out of the picture. They've done you know, a great deal to succeed in that regard. So what we now have to do moving forward is to figure out how do we get that, them off that trajectory? How we, do we stabilize this relationship and stop being engaged in this ruinous, destructive confrontation? And in a world where we have to deal with climate change, 
which is an inescapable fact. I mean, I know there are still people out there debating it, but for most of us, it's an inescapable fact. Where we have a pandemic, that is, this is literally an existential set of threats to humanity. We have to figure out how do we at least deal with the Russians, Chinese and others in tackling some of these issues. This is very difficult. You know, we're in a whole new world that we went in before. Our institutions aren't well structured for that. We've got an unfinished agenda with Russia. It's unacceptable for the Russians to keep messing around in the way that they are and, you know, kind of basically goading us into, you know, kind of coming back in kind, which, you know, I think we have to, you know, try to resist here because we're going to just be get pulled down and pulled down and pulled down if we keep engaging in this, uh, you know, endless circle of, you know, fighting uh, with Russia. And we have to be able to also tackle our own domestic divisions as a way of being able to uh, deal with these larger existential crises that we're now facing. But, you know, we've had a missed opportunity with Russia, not just an arms control, because I think at some point we might be able to make some moves on that one, but on dealing with the pandemic. You know, Russia, even in the, the height of the Cold War, we were able to deal with them on smallpox and on polio and tuberculosis and ultimately to some degree on HIV AIDS. We have to kind of find a way of tackling issues with Russia on a professional level, even as we kind of, you know, accept that they're going to be a very difficult interlocutor. But diplomacy is a tool. It's not, you know, kind of an end in itself. You're not appeasing Russia if you're engaging with them. You have to use those tools to um, send strong messages. And you have to also find ways of averting any spiraling confrontation. And you know, there's one area where, you know, I don't think um, President Trump has really had credit. And you know, it's a, um, a difficult um, you know, point perhaps always to make, but we could have been in a much worse place with North Korea. Now, admittedly, you know, Kim Jong-un has just been parading this massive, you know, uh, nuclear missile um, on, you know, his kind of across his main squares. But we were on the verge of a really serious confrontation with North Korea when Trump came in. And by this, you know, kind of quirky personal diplomacy, he took the edge off that for a period. Didn't resolve it, but he took the edge off it for a period. So, you know, sometimes the unconventional and, you know, um, you know head scratching approach actually, you know, does uh, work. With Russia, it didn't work at all because, you know, uh, every other president's tried personal chemistry and they've kind of, you know, tried their own, you know, different approach to this. And Russia requires a very careful coherent and consistent approach and also working very closely with our allies. You can't just go at it, you know, ad hoc and half cocked, just like the same with China. Um, so I want to um, ask you a final question about Russia, which is, uh, you know, especially as we're looking ahead uh, post November, where we may have to reassess the relationship and look at Russia a little bit more uh, objectively uh, about what where its assets are uh, on and uh, liabilities. Um, and I want to start by um, referring to an article you and I wrote in Foreign Affairs 19 years ago, um, at a time which in the post 9-11 uh, era, there were a lot of people who were questioning that Saudi Arabia had any more leverage in the, in the oil market, the global oil market, the energy market, and Right, that Russia was going to overtake Saudi Arabia as uh, the, the country that is going to have more lever. And you and I disagreed with that at that time. One reason we disagreed with it was the argument that Saudi Arabia has a trump card uh, that Russia does not have, which is spare production capacity. And, and Russia was producing at full capacity and was likely to do so for years to come. We saw 19 years later, last spring, when there was a you know, uh, an attempt to come together. And then uh, Saudi Arabia and OPEC did not come together with Russia. That in fact, Saudi Arabia exercised that very card 19 years later, where it uh, uh, flooded the market, uh, increased its production to two and a half million barrels a day, cut prices in a way that uh, uh, just as the pandemic yeah. hit, and obviously no one expected that. And clearly it had perhaps unintended consequences, but there was an exercise of power by the Saudis that, that was born out of that uh, excess uh, production capacity. Um, what's your assessment of where Russia is on this issue and uh, on other issues in terms of what's, what, where's, what's the source of the power? What's the, what are the, what are the aim to do, particularly as we're gonna have to 
uh, think about uh, our European policy and uh, our relationship with NATO and our relationship with Europe after um, uh, you know the last four years. Uh, so I, I wonder if you could reflect on sort of what are they what are they aiming to be and what is their source of power and and where does oil come in? Well, energy has been a, a very important part of that, um, especially when it comes to Europe, um, but also as um, you know, oil um, you know, has become such an important uh, feature in um, international affairs. You know, Russia, you know, at that point that we were writing was, was certainly um, reinventing itself as a sort of an energy superpower uh, to try to kind of play in global um, energy markets to oil but also to really use gas and natural gas, pipe gas, um, and then you know, later LNG, which isn't been quite so um, effective as um, a, a tool for uh, foreign policy and direct influence, particularly in Europe and, and elsewhere where um, uh, it is able to uh, command the market. We've seen some of the limitations of that recently, of course, because every time you have an economic downturn, uh, energy prices go down. But Russia had learned from uh, the Soviet period that its whole rise and fall was very much contingent um, upon energy prices. I mean, the real peak of um, Russian influence comes with um, oil prices at $150 a barrel. You know, so back in uh, 2007, 2008, which is when you know, Russia launched the um, attack on Georgia. And uh, you know, Russia had learned um, you know, to stash away uh, money in the good times and not to go on a spending spree. And I think, you know, one of the real secrets of um, Putin's success has been building up these sovereign and national wealth funds uh, to be able to really have um, uh, an impact in marshalling resources and be able to be throwing money around, you know, to re really exert influence in, uh, in neighbouring countries. I think, you know, what we saw um, uh, recently on the eve of the, t uh, the pandemic was a bit of a, uh, a miscalculation uh, there. Um, Russia had always been playing with Saudi Arabia and others in OPEC, um, you know, promising to um, engage in production cuts when prices were dipping, but you know, kind of gambling on the fact that others would um, would make those cuts and that Russia could, you know, say they had but not, and and really kind of um, take advantage of larger volumes of production, and that nobody, you know, like the Saudis, wouldn't, you know, basically call their bluff. Well, of course, you know, they did that at a pretty critical era because maybe the Saudis, you know, saw where things uh, were trending. Right now, you know, energy, um, you know, while we're still in this pandemic and uh, recession phase, you know, it's not so easy for um, Russia to play the energy card the way that it had. And, you know, we're seeing a lot more of um, Russian efforts at coercion. But I do think we're actually also seeing now some signs and, you know, perhaps we don't have much time, you know, to go into this of Russian overextension. Because in the area where, you know, you've really focused your attention since 2015, you know, Russia's really tried to be a big player in the Middle East through the intervention in Syria. You know, Russia's also, you know, tried to um, play all of its relationships, not just with the Saudis on energy issues, but with Israel, uh, where Russia has, you know, a very different relationship from the uh, Soviet period with all the Russian speakers um, who are, uh, are now in Israel and coming into Israeli politics uh, in, in, in a more apparent way. Um, you know, with its relationship with Iran, very difficult to have Iran and Israel as two pillars of your Middle East policy, though, as all of us know, uh, given the adversarial relationship uh, between the two. But Russia's tried to present itself as an arbiter in, uh, in the Middle East, um, also in, uh, in Libya, uh, and, you know, more broadly, Venezuela, you know, in an intervention to head off the possibility of a, um, a US invasion that Russia thought might happen there um, uh, to topple Maduro. But Russia really trying to kind of make um, it clear that it can be a spoiler, as uh, if not an arbiter in a whole host of international conflicts. But I now see with Nagorno-Karabakh uh, now inflamed again an open war between Azerbaijan and Armenia, all the protests in Belarus that the Russians are very discomfort about similar political upheaval in Kyrgyzstan on Russia borders, uh, the fact that Syria is still not uh, stabilized, uh, ongoing um, you know, problems in places like Libya where you know, Russia has uh, moved as well. And now Turkey flexing its muscles um, in uh, some of those um, arenas as well, Libya and uh, Nagorno-Karabakh in ways they hadn't previously. That there's a lot of kind of spillover from uh, Russian interventions. Syria, um, you know, Russia and Turkey have been at loggerheads there as well. And the factor in all of this is the United States being missing in action. 
you know, Russia has also always, I think, um, really been more successful when it's playing and pivoting off against us. You know, we've been the country that they love to hate, the main opponent, the reason you know, that they intervened in 2016, but we've also been you know, the country that they could mobilize everybody else against in places, including in the Middle East. And now that you know, we've taken a big step back where we haven't really been the player in the way that we were previously and we haven't shown up a lot of the fights, Russia is finding itself now juggling everything with not us as the foil to push back again. And I think it'd be very interesting to see you know, what happens in the next several months and where Russia finds itself bogged down in ways that you know, it, it wasn't anticipating in some of these um, external uh, conflicts and uh, external uh, shifts in you know, places like Belarus and elsewhere. Great, um, I wanna ask you the last question for this session, which is um, a little bit more personal. Um, uh, I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, I have advised both Republican and Democratic administrations in the past. Um, uh, our colleagues in Washington, many of them do. Some of the academics go in and out, occasionally uh, go as professionals uh, to advise government on various issues uh, from health to foreign policy. Um, and one of the dilemmas, uh, obviously, that a lot of people experience when you have um, an administration with whom you profoundly disagree, uh, where you have to ask yourself the question, uh, are you just providing them legitimacy? Are, you, are they helping them uh, be as bad as they are? Or are you really weighing in in a, in a good way to, to uh, uh, protect the national interest as you see it or uh, serve the country in some ways? We know that a lot of people don't have the luxury of thinking that way because that's their careers and they don't want to lose their jobs. Uh, but there are a lot of people like you uh, and others who have jobs and, and uh, uh, they, they can leave government and you know, be welcomed by uh, the Brooklyn Institution or, or somewhere else um, who don't have to worry so much about the job. It's about what you're, whether you're doing more good or, or, than bad. And there are people who've resigned uh, when, they, when they face things they can accept. Uh, but there are a lot of people, professionals I'm talking about, not, not you know, uh, people who are driven by a political agenda. Uh, there are people who stay. Um, and where does one draw that, what, where does then one draw that boundary? And how did it play out for you? And you know, I've talked to a lot of people about this in terms of whether or not it's wise to leave or not to leave, or where's, where does one draw the line? I'm just wondering how you th thought about this. Uh, uh, you know, when you were uh, in the White House, uh, but also reflecting on it now that you're outside. Look, it's, it's a very important question that, you know, a lot of people grapple with in different ways. Um, you know, I think that you have to, you know, be very clear with yourself, you know, that if you're no longer part of the solution and you're part of a problem for a particular issue set, then, you know, you, you've got to get out of there. When, um, you know, I made the decision to go into the administration in the first place, it wasn't a particularly easy one because it was highly politically charged and not being a partisan person, you know, of course I did have um, some feelings of disquiet about this. I really wanted to do something on the Russia front for all of the reasons that we just talked about, you know, seeing what happened in 2016 and realizing that the, you know, the country was in a very dangerous situation. You know, I, I felt that I couldn't really stand by when I was approached and asked for advice. And then, you know, uh, eventually approached and asked, would I, you know, consider uh, going into the National Security Council? And I got some uh, really good advice from some very close colleagues who'd done very similar things, one of whom was Martin Indyk, who, you know, as you know, made a, a similar decision um, uh, to um, take on the thankless task of being, um, you know, uh, the Middle East uh, peace envoy at a time when most people said, look, it's pointless, you're not going to be able to achieve anything. And Martin had said, well, even if there was just a, a, a minuscule chance of achieving something, he would take it. And you know, Martin being one of my you know, colleagues at Brookings, he said, set yourself a time frame. If you feel that you're not making any progress, but you're starting to go down that slippery slope of making things worse, leave. And so you know, I set myself a two year time frame. I stood a little bit longer than that um, for a, a variety of reasons. 
But, you know, I realized in the time that I, um, uh, you know, had made that decision to wrap up that I really should leave because there were so many things that were happening then that were deeply disturbing. And I did speak out about them. I spoke out about them internally, you know, as I said at the testimony. And, you know, when I was called upon to testify with other colleagues, there was no question in my mind that I would do that to speak out and tell people what I had seen, you know, bear witness as a, as a fact witness about what, what I had seen there as well. And I went in every single day, you know, asking myself, you know, am I making the situation worse of trying to tackle, um, you know, a, a way of handling uh, the fallout from what happened in 2016 with Russia? There was a whole host of other issues that were in my purview as well. Ukraine you know, was one of them, which is one of the reasons, you know, I ended up testifying, but also Turkey and our relations with all of our allies in Europe. And, you know, there were periods where, you know, I felt actually that we were as a team um, of all the people across government, all the professionals that you're referencing there, you know, succeeding in getting um, uh, some things actually done that were positive on the fronts of national security and also were beneficial to the country as a whole. But I certainly did not want to get involved in the domestic politics. And part of the reason for wanting to leave you know, after a two year mark was that the campaign would start well, as it turned out, the campaign started even earlier, it was almost perpetual campaign. And that gave me, you know, a lot of pause for thought. And so, you know, I felt it was the, the right thing to go in uh, for the reasons that I did. It was also the right thing to leave. You know, perhaps I should have left a little earlier, given, you know, the way that some things were trending. But I spoke out about the things that I was um, disturbed about. I went through the appropriate chains and I've spoken out about them since. But I do think that the most important thing is that we still have to get over these parties and divisions. You know, as I, I keep saying, you know, if I think it's important for people like me and others who are professionals to try to, as much as you possibly can, maintain that non-partisan stance. Because the country needs to have people that it can look to who can, you know, provide objective information like you and Sh Shibley do and, you know, many others you know, in a way that, you know, we can give us, give people the best analysis that we possibly can without a political prism. But if there's something that is wrong, it's incumbent upon you when you take an oath of office to speak out. Well, thank you so much for this. Uh, th this was frank and open and, and really helpful, I think, for a lot of people, because I, I can tell you that in our community, there are many experts, as you know, in, in the University of Maryland, the Washington community broadly, uh, who have regular jobs who often are called upon to serve in government. And, and this is something that crosses everyone's mind. This is extremely helpful. Um, I wanna thank you so much for taking the time and being with us. Um, this has been great, uh, informative, insightful, helpful. Uh, I know that um, you took time from being immersed in your uh, book writing. Uh, we all look forward to reading that book in a few months. Uh, uh, I know that it will be read widely because everybody hopefully will be in a different era that is less polarized, uh, that people will be looking objectively to see what a sensible American foreign policy would look like, what a sensible relationship with Russia would look like uh, without having to worry about the consequences for our domestic politics. You have been uh, you know, enlightening, you have been um, very dignified in the way you've handled this in a way that uh, those of us who know who know you know it's not surprising uh, and you've gained a lot of fans in our community at the University of Maryland so thank you so much for honoring us and joining us today well thank you very much Shibli. it's a, a pleasure and also an honor and um, you know I, I really encourage um, everybody um, in the community and who's listening if they have a chance at public service to please take it because I mean, the country needs um, patriots and I mean, it needs um, expertise and it needs all of us, you know, to basically engage uh, to, um, you know, help us move forward. And um, all I would just say is just to encourage everybody to do what they can as well. In the meantime, go out and vote because that's the one, you know, real act of citizenship uh, that we all have, um, uh, you know, within our power to, um, to engage in. And again, just thank you so much uh, for having me. It's a great honor to be part of the, Sadat Forum. I, I really appreciate this. Thank you so much. And this concludes the first virtual Sadat Forum at the University of Maryland. Thank you.